tackles the green slime, currently attacking one of the beauty spots of Hungary. Welcome. In the show tonight, another of our forecasts for the year 2020. Can we delay the process of ageing and live longer? Meanwhile, are the Hungarians helpless against the deathly green slime invading their inland sea? Can this experiment help make motor racing a safer sport? And 1991, a space odyssey created by computer. But first... Mm, some fronds there. Ooh, look, a sunken galleon. Let's move around here and see what... Oh, now, is that another old wreck? Thanks, Howard. This is the latest miniaturised gadget from Japan. It's an underwater camera designed to work at depths of up to 50 metres. Inside this housing, there's a video camera along with a light. And both are mounted on a motor which revolves to give 360 degrees field of view. Now, the designers say that the visibility is as good as being down in the sea yourself. So, how does it look then, Howard? Well, I'm not sure that's your best angle, actually, Kate. Do you want to put it back in the water for me? Now, besides being able to see the picture, I can also control it from here. Sending signals down the cable to the camera below means that I can uh, tilt it from side to side. And if it's getting a bit dark, then I can uh, leave that light on. The idea is that you throw it over the, the side of a boat. It's for the fisherman who has everything. But you don't need to just look for shoals of fish. You could inspect the bottom of the sea. Or you could put it in your bath and see if it can find the soap, which is why it's called a bathoscope. Bad career move. Here's Judith reporting from Eastern Europe. Hang on. This doesn't look right. That's not Hungary. better. Most of us have some preconceptions about Eastern Europe and before I visited Hungary I imagined it as grey and bleak but in fact it's a mainly rural country with a well-developed agricultural system and beautiful scenery which attracts large numbers of visitors. Every year, over three million visit Lake Balaton in the west of the country, known as the Sea of Hungary. But the prosperity of the region is now under threat. Both farming and tourism are upsetting the ecological balance in the lake. Runoff from farmland is high in phosphates from fertilizers, and so is the sewage produced by the millions of tourists. Since the 1960s, the amount of phosphate pollution in the lake has increased by 20%. And that's only benefited one thing, the algae living in this water. Algae which thrive on phosphates have turned the lake into a slimy green soup that tourists certainly don't enjoy. So the area has been made a protection zone and national funds made available for a clean-up. First, a drainage system was built which diverts most of the sewage away from the lake. Then, phosphate removal was introduced at those sewage plants which still discharge into the water. But at the western end, the lake is fed by the Zala River, and that was still a major source of phosphate. The problem is the town of Zelazeged, 50 kilometers upstream. The town's sewage is put untreated into the river, and because it's outside the protection area, it doesn't qualify for any of the clean-up money. So the solution had to be found downriver, and it turned out to be to use one of the problems, the algae, to remove the other, the phosphates. They constructed an 18 square kilometre lake, which is shallow, warm and still. Perfect conditions for the algae to thrive. Water from the Zala River spends 30 days in this lake before moving on to Lake Balaton. And here, the algae bloom, use up the phosphates, 
and die. And that traps the phosphate pollution out of harm's way in the sediment at the bottom of the new lake. So by the time the water leaves, 80% of the phosphates have been removed, as well as other pollutants like nitrates and heavy metals. These measures have stabilised the situation in Lake Balaton, but works now started on a second larger lake to remove the remainder of the phosphates from the polluted Zala River. The Hungarians now believe they preserve their greatest natural asset as well as their tourist trade. And there's an extra advantage. As a wildlife sanctuary, this new lake is attracting tourists of its own. Birds. weather has finally blown itself away. It's going to be bright and sunny across most of the country. Top temperatures are This is the trouble with national radio, is that the information you get isn't always specific enough. Travel news. The airbags on the M6 have cleared and all traffic is now moving freely on motorways. And it's not just the weather reports that can miss you out. But having separate local radio stations to serve small areas is obviously an expensive operation, unless you run things like they do in the West Country. Where a company in charge of commercial stations in Bristol, Reading, Bournemouth and Swindon has started controlling them all from one location, while still keeping the information local. Oh, excuse me a moment. Yeah, even in the depths of winter, you're going to go reaching for your surfboards with this one. Hello. Music played at the control centre in Bristol is sent down broadcast quality telephone lines to the four unmanned stations on the network. Now everybody hears the music and there's nothing new in that. But listen to what happens when I come to play a station ident. The sensational sound there of the Beach Boys and uh, good vibrations. Down in Bournemouth, I wouldn't hear any mention of that Bristol station. I'd get the Bournemouth ident. Yeah, the sensational sound of the Beach Boys there and uh, good vibrations. While over in Reading, yeah, the I'd also hear my own station there and uh, the good same vibrations. So while listeners can tune into the same music, they get their own local jingles. It's possible to do this because all the unmanned stations are linked by a network of data lines to this control centre. Each station houses a computer on which local information, like those jingles, is stored. So at the push of a button here, I can trigger each computer to transmit its own local messages. I can also update the information for each station. For instance, this evening I phoned up the weather centre and then recorded separate local forecasts onto the computers for Bournemouth and Reading. So when it's time for a weather flash, every area gets its own. Here's what my local computer is transmitting. Severe gales affecting the south coast, making it a stormy night in Bournemouth. Judith. And mine? They should stay dry in the Reading area, but quite Oh, chilly. good. In Howard. <laughs> So with this system, local news about the weather, travel, competition results and even jumble sales in each town is actually controlled from the network centre. And from Bristol to Bournemouth, listeners need never know that they're sharing the same but fab DJ. Now here's Judith. And here's another sort of forecast. In 1930, the average life expectancy in this country was 60. 30 years later, it was 70. And today, another 30 years on, it's 75. But what will the next 30 years bring? Will we be living even longer? And what will it be like growing old in 2020? There are two sorts of ways in which you can counteract the damage done by the passage of time. And one of them is obviously to get rid of specific defects as they appear whenever a hole appears in the boat you plug it and the other is to slow down the overall aging clock there is an overall aging process and we know we can modify it and that probably is what by 2020 we should have applied ourselves to in fact we could apply ourselves to it now dr alex comfort Already, medical science and the move towards healthier lifestyles are attacking the specific diseases we associate with ageing. 
But as the risk of death from heart disease or cancer is reduced, another sort of defect is beginning to emerge. Even without disease, we gradually become frail as we age. Our muscles get weaker, we heal more slowly, our bones become brittle. And these effects of ageing may be much harder to control. We may only see the grey hair and wrinkles, but ageing affects every cell in our bodies. As time passes, the cells become less and less efficient at making the chemicals we need for our bodies to function well. So to prevent these effects, scientists will need to know exactly which chemicals each person is missing. And a recent study in America suggests that this chemical, human growth hormone, may help some people. Many old people stopped producing it. Indeed, it was thought they no longer needed it. But when it was given to a group of elderly men, the results were surprising. Oh, I feel very great. I mean, uh, I gained a little pep uh, and energy. The patient's muscle weight increased, fatty tissue decreased, and the skin became thicker. The researchers are very optimistic. This probably gives us a new intervention or a new method for uh, improving the quality of life in old age. The idea needs more research, but even if further trials are successful, it's not certain that growth hormone is the whole answer to the problems of ageing, especially since we don't yet know how it works or for how many people. But it does demonstrate an important approach that it may be possible to replace the chemicals our ageing cells can no longer produce. But even if our cells are given all the chemicals they need, it can't keep them going forever. Eventually, they simply stop and die. It looks as though we're programmed to run down. There is an overall program which, as it were, engineers the body. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a characteristic lifespan for each species. And we do know that that program, whatever it is, can be altered. It's possible to slow it down. It can be carried out quite easily in rodents simply by feeding them every other day instead of every day. But you get serious problems when you try to apply that to people because in the first place it might not work in the same way in people as it does in rodents. And then in the second place nobody's going to uh, eat every other day from the age of three onwards. I mean, let's see if they live longer. Nobody yet knows why dietary restriction works, but some scientists believe that restricted food intake somehow disables a clock in our bodies and that they may one day be able to design a drug to do the same job. It's very difficult to predict how large an increase you would get by interfering with the rate of aging because other things may take over. There may be clocks running which don't strike at the present time. But you, in mice you can double the lifespan. I wouldn't have thought you could have done that in humans. I think it's more likely you might get a 5 to 10% slowing, and that would mean that at the age of 60 you'd have the health you would have had at 50 and so on. Despite the optimism of scientists in this field, a lot of people still claim that five score years, a century of living, is just too long. But will their view have changed by 2020? When people say, God, no, I don't want to live to be a centenarian, it's because they think of a centenarian being a decrepit old fogey who's got an ear trumpet. And if we could avoid that, then uh, I think people would probably be quite glad to stay around for a while. So, a brighter old age, according to Alex Comfort. Now, the annual computer graphics festival, Imagina, gets underway this week in Monte Carlo. From over 500 entries, the judges have just selected their final shortlist. There are cartoons like this one called Venus and Milo from the National Supercomputer Center in Chicago. <laughs> And there are pieces of pure research. These swimming pool scenes from digital pictures in London were done to show off a new way of simulating light. Usually, the lighting in computer animations is all about reflections of solid shapes. But those images mimic the changing distortions as light passes through a rippling water surface. They split the light, hitting the water into triangular beams, and worked out how each beam would be distorted as the surface rippled, then added up the total amount of light reaching each point on the bottom as the moving beams played over each other to get this dancing light pattern. And they followed the beams back up again for the surface view. This new way of treating light as a beam that can be focused or spread out could be used whenever light gets distorted by passing through complex surfaces. 
But the overall winner is tipped to be a space odyssey from Thinking Machines Corporation in Boston. It was done on a parallel computer, powerful enough to generate these graceful movements in the time it takes you to watch them. Amazing. Now, this tiny plastic rod could soon be helping to save lives. It's part of a new technique for diagnosing one of the most widespread diseases in the world, malaria, which kills about two million people every year. To show you how it works, I'll slip the rod into this tube of blood which has been taken from a malaria victim. This then goes into a high-speed centrifuge, which uh, we'll set going and we'll come back to. Recognising the disease depends on finding the telltale signs of infection in the blood. The disease starts with the bite of a female mosquito. As it feeds, it injects tiny malarial parasites into the bloodstream. Eventually, the parasites end up in the red blood cells from where they can wreak havoc. But spotting the infected cells amongst loads of normal cells can be tough. Even with the experienced eye of a skilled technician, it takes around four minutes to check a sample. Now, that may not sound too long, but it's precious time that a busy African hospital can't afford when it has to carry out over 3,000 malaria tests a week. And saving time is what this new technique is all about. American scientists noticed that because the parasite lives off the red blood cells, these cells become lighter. They actually weigh less than healthy red blood cells. So a centrifuge could separate them out for examination. As the tube of blood spins, the heavy, healthy cells are forced to the end of the tube. The infected cells are lighter and are left at the top end of the red blood cell layer. But the parasites are still difficult to spot because all the infected cells are compacted together in a small area. Well, that's where the plastic rod comes in. It's been designed to be precisely the right weight so that it floats in between the healthy red blood cells and the rest of the blood. And even in the centrifuge, it stops just there, smearing out the infected cells along the tube wall. Well, my sample should be ready now. So let's take that out. And we should be able to see very clearly, much easier to spot now under the microscope. And to make them really clear, uh, a fluorescent dye has been added. And so they should show up as fluorescent or shining stars. I shall very carefully maneuver that in and we should be able to see on a fine tune. There we are, very clearly. That bright one there is a parasite. Well, accurate diagnosis of malaria is becoming ever more important with the increase around the world of strains resistant to drug treatment. This simple technique may help, not only to identify victims quickly, but to make sure that only those who need treatment actually receive it. Today, medical researchers announce new evidence for what may be a key process in the development of many different cancers. It's known that some families are more prone to cancer than others. The team at London's Royal Free Hospital has been studying a particularly unfortunate family in which many members have suffered from more than one type of cancer. What they think is playing a part in all these cancers is the abnormal activity of a single enzyme in the cells. This enzyme's job is to break a strand of tightly coiled DNA and unwind it so the genes in that section can be used. It's a complex manoeuvre and if the enzyme goes even slightly wrong, mistakes can build up, helping to turn a cell cancerous. The researchers think that in the cancer-prone family, they found an inherited genetic defect which makes the enzyme go wrong and they have also discovered that many other cancer-causing genes affect the same enzyme. If they're right, then scientists may have moved a step closer to understanding a common route to many cancers. Two American teams are this week arguing over which one of them invented a new way of sexing sperm, which could allow farmers to make livestock the sex they want. 
The new technique sorts sperm according to whether they carry an X or Y sex chromosome by using the fact that X sperm contain a fraction more DNA than Ys. The DNA in the sperm is labelled with a harmless dye. Then, using ultrasound, the solution is broken up into drops, each containing a single sperm. Then a sensor checks how much dye each drop has taken up. More dye means more DNA, which means it must be an X. When it spots an X, the machine gives that drop a small electric charge. So when the stream passes through a magnet at the end, the X sperm gets pulled off to the side and the Y goes straight on. At the moment, the technique has only been tried out on farm animals, and human X and Y sperm may be much harder to sort because they contain almost the same amount of DNA. If it does work, it might help families with sex-determined diseases like haemophilia to avoid handing it on to their children. Ever since grey squirrels arrived in this country over a hundred years ago, they've been blamed for the steady decline of their native cousins, the red squirrels. Now, a study has revealed that what's decimating the red squirrels is actually indigestion from eating acorns. In autumn, both sets of squirrels eat hazelnuts, but with the number of hazel trees in Britain declining, the nuts run out by October. Grey squirrels turn to acorns and continue to thrive through the winter, but red squirrels can't remove the toxins from acorns, so even if they eat as many, they start to lose weight, and when spring comes round, they're less successful at breeding. The research group says if Britain's remaining red squirrels can't find another crop which suits them, then the only hope is to give them a gene from their cousins to help them digest acorns. Five hours from now, if you're awake, you might see some strange glowing lights in the dawn sky part of a NASA experiment with auroras. Auroras occur naturally when charged particles from space get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. As they bounce around, they glow, and over the poles, the results can be spectacular. But they also produce massive bursts of radio waves, which can disrupt communications and upset sensitive electronics. The same troublesome effect could be caused by gases released from the shuttle, so to check this, a NASA satellite will be creating artificial auroras by releasing clouds of barium and lithium particles high above the atmosphere. The releases start at 1.40 our time, and if you look out towards Brazil, you just might see green and red glowing patches as large and bright as a full moon. Now, a report on how even the most horrific-looking accident can have a positive outcome. The San Marino Grand Prix is go. Senna leads, Prost second, Mansell third, Berger in fourth position, and Patrese. Now, already the two Ferraris are jostling with Patrese. Glorious noise it is, hearing proper racing engines again after those turbos. Although Ferrari then... Oops, and big problems. That was something broken on the car for sure. Big crash by Berger. Without any doubt, it went straight on. And, oh, heavens above, this is dreadful. This is the, there is, there are no words that can add to the, this appalling picture. The car off. And thank heavens there is a fire tender on the spot immediately. The drivers at least have ox a pure air piped through to their helmets due to a special valve and the fire is out. The first doctor on the scene was Professor Sidney Watkins. I arrived there just as the fire marshals were putting the final flames out. Gerhard was still in the cockpit but was unconscious. We lifted him out of the uh, crash and carried him a safe distance away from the vehicle because there was a lot of fuel pumping out from the uh, Ferrari. Amazingly, Berger had no broken bones and the only serious burns he received were to the backs of his hands. In fact, he was well enough to discharge himself from hospital only 24 hours later. But he did suffer some less obvious injuries. He was complaining of a lot of pain from his skin, which had been affected by corrosion from the fuel from the car. Racing driver's suits protect them very well from fire, but can't stop the highly volatile fuels used in motor racing from leaking in. Well, I thought we ought to look for a material that would provide that sort of 
physical characteristic that the driver could sweat. It's what they call breathability in the fabric industry, uh, and yet would be protective from the outside or corrosive fluids like petrol. Two or three weeks later, I saw Mike Theobald, who I knew was in the uniform manufacturing business, so I said to him uh, it'd be a good idea if he would begin a search, which he did. I tried quite a few materials, but I was not successful in stopping the fuel from going through. So I looked at um, contacting BP Research, and they were aware of an Israeli company who were obviously working with chemical warfare suits. And somewhere I knew that there was probably a link there that we could adapt their work to what we required. The actual coating that was eventually developed by myself and the Israelis is this light blue area here. The material here is just a standard flame resistant material. And of course, the fire retardant properties of the material still remain the same. I'm quite happy with this. Although it looks very, very dangerous, we've done this many, many times, and obviously I'm very, very aware that um, what I'm doing is uh, very well controlled. It is becoming quite warm now. The standard test that uh, is required for the suit to be passed is about 12 to 13 seconds. As you can see, we are now burning upwards towards 38 to 40 seconds. There is no actual physical penetration through the cloth onto the arm at all, and the arm is totally unaffected. But while being fireproof and fuel-proof, the material must also be able to let sweat out. The water is only at body temperature, but in just one minute, the material allows through enough vapour to steam up the bowl above. At the moment, the Israelis won't reveal exactly how the coating works, but there's already been considerable interest from other industries whose workers handle fuel and solvents. However, the material's first use will be in racing. Falklands veteran Simon Weston has recently taken up motorsport. Well, my involvement with motorsport is I've been driving Group N racing cars, saloon cars, for the last 12 months. Um, I had the opportunity, so I just went for it. Myself, personally, I'm very concerned about safety because, obviously, I've been badly burnt once. I don't particularly want it to happen again. The new suit that's under development, I think, is a tremendous idea if it's going to lead to the safety of drivers and it's going to lead to the safety of anybody who deals with fuel, you know, I, it it's just can't come soon enough, really. If it is as good as it's said to be, it just can't come soon enough. A gentler sport, which is also perfect exercise, is swimming, which can now be done away from chlorine and the crowds. Competitive swimmers already work out in the gym, but weight training only allows an effective pull in one direction, whereas swimming strokes are three-dimensional. With pulleys and weights, you can strengthen the right muscles for any stroke, putting them under constant resistance, just like they are in the water. So you can train seriously if perhaps you're ill with an ear infection or something and can't get in the water, or like me, you can simply work off your Christmas excesses. Excesses I certainly had, but I do think I've had enough for tonight. We'll be back at the same time again next week. Till then, good night. Tomorrow, Jacko brushes up on his telephone skills. Good morning. Splash. <laughs> well, that's very intemperate language. I don't know how you can do it. Do what? I don't know how you can just lie there like that. Well, it's easy. You pick your feet off the floor and you swing them <laughs> at the end of the city. Thanks for everything, Giles. No hard feelings. You've been a brick. One is brought up to be a brick, but it's awfully nice to be called one. <laughs> Brush Strokes returns tomorrow at 7.40 on 1.
And despite some none too handy strokes against him, your man's spirits are high on opening day at the British Empire.